now going to introduce uh, our third and final speaker for this plenary, um, uh, Advocate uh, Temba Gangnugai Tobi, um, who is a practitioner at the Johannesburg Bar. Uh, Advocate Ngugai Tobi is going to speak, uh, as an in Ninka indicated, a little bit about alternatives, but also is going to speak about uh, some of the issues um, from the perspective uh, of crafting um, a different way of thinking. Over to you, Temba. Thank you, Nolundi. Uh, I'm very pleased to be uh, here and to be to have been invited to the conference. Um, I also noted that uh, the, there are people in Durban and in East London and in Johannesburg, so I presume I can dip in and out of my native language uh, is a toss. So with your permission, Madam Chair, um, that's perfect, Ngos. All right, All right, so uh, the topic I'm going to be dealing with, according to the program, is the constitutionality of the uh, Communal Land Rights uh, Bill. Um, it's a bill that goes together with the policy that was passed in 2014, um, or at least adopted in 2014. So, the Sitata and Don Teto, Oyeloayo, then Doctor Draft Beer, Uyelang Holumente, Kuba Ufuna, Quezinda, Gusalaguzo, Abanda Bamyama is Kakul. Uh, these were previously um, bantu stands. Kamanyama amazu kumana kusitwa gazi communal areas. Pambi kwa kuba kutuwa zi bantu stands. Zazi kade zizaziwa jenge native areas. Kukoke umteto o yiluayo o se parlamenti nguwa kusiteta yu. O chongene nendo kwa kuba na umtaba o kwe zindao. Maupatwe njani na Gulumente, Zinkosi, Kwanye Nabant, Ika Malalom Tetoge, E Communal Land Rights Bill. Aufigi Gelom Teto, Ufigo Westbin, Waukale, Gomnyaga, a two thousand and four. Inkunda Yomka Gosseco, Gomnyaga twenty ten. Yati, in Zames Gahulmente, a Azi Mamananga, Nomka Gosseco, but in your galum tet, who come chagging go. Who your loss it and our nam plant. So, what do I think about the Communal Land Rights Act or the draft bill? Um, let me stake my claim at the outset. I believe that the draft bill, if passed in its current form, will be unconstitutional. Some of the reasons for that belief have already been alluded to by Aninka. But let me add um, further reasons why, if that bill is passed in its current form, it would be unconstitutional. The first is we have to look at the theory underpinning Section 25.6 of the Constitution. Lele solo jake linika amalunga loko khulumende. Solo jake 25.6. Uti ke, yes nge is, a person or community whose tenure of land is legally insecure as a result of past racially discriminatory laws or practices is entitled to the extent provided by an act of parliament, either to tenure, which is legally secure, or to comparable redress. Now, the section specifically refers to racial discrimination. And in this sense, it must be read together with section nine of the constitution, which also outlaws racial discrimination. 
But in addition to outlawing racial discrimination, it imposes a duty on the state to take positive measures to dismantle patterns of existing racial discrimination. So the first theor theoretical underpinning of section 25.6 is that it is an equalizing right. And the second element to section 25.6 is that it's located in section 25 which is a section intended to transform property relations that were created under apartheid. So the second theoretical basis for that section is that it's a transformational right. Now, both the equalizing and the transformational are central to understanding what law may be passed under that section, because we also have section seven of the constitution that imposes a duty in section seven two to respect, protect, promote, and fulfill the rights in the Bill of Rights. Now, the question then is, how does the bill see the role of the different institutions that are involved in land administration and land ownership in the communal areas. The dominant element to the act is it believes, and Inca says it believes that there is a legal vacuum in relation to the land that is held um, by communities. But I want to argue that what the premise of the act is, or the bill is, is that it believes that the land in community, in communal areas is actually state land. And it can be controlled by the state through traditional institutions or traditional leaders. That is a historical problem. Right. When you consider where this comes from, it comes from history. The state has always put the chiefs between the government and the people and entrusted them control over the land. This is clear from two pieces of legislation. The Native Administration Act of 1927, as well as the Native Trust Act of 1936. When you read both of them, the one creates a trust in order to control native land. The other creates traditional institutions that are accountable to the government in order to exercise political control over native people. The combination of these two, political control over native people, extended to political control over land. Now, Aninka is being too generous to the government when she says they regard communal areas as a legal vacuum. I argue that there is something more sinister, which is they regard those in the same way as the colonial and the apartheid state did. That the true political power is inseparable to control over the land. Now, that's problem number one. Instead of transforming existing colonial and apartheid relations to the land. The risk is that the communal land rights bill will entrench them. So it does not serve the first of the two 
theoretical underpinnings to section 25.6. It's a regressive law. Instead of taking us forward, it's taking us backwards. Secondly, what's wrong with it? Second problem with it, it uses a vague notion of community, right? A vague notion of community. So Anika spoke about the 60% um, requirement for passing various decisions. Um, you'll find it in various parts of the, of the legislation. Various decisions are to be passed by 60% of the members of the community. But this notion of the 60% of the community renders invisible, right? The individual and the family, it renders them completely invisible. They disappear. So you can go into a hall, to a big meeting. And in that big meeting, someone else will make a decision about whether or not your plot of land, right? should now be registered for ownership by the community. The mere fact that you object will simply be taken into account by someone else will make a decision on your behalf, right? Why is that a problem? It's a continuation of the colonial construct to native land because the colonial construct towards native land never regarded it as being capable of individual ownership or individual control in the same way as European land. So that clash of the European construct towards the land versus the traditional African customary, whatever terminology that the colonists constructed, lives through, right, the bill. It lives through the bill because it still does not realize that the native is as capable of exercising autonomous rights over a piece of property, right? Now, this is an old problem which the bill carries through. What's wrong with that? What's wrong with that? I mean, firstly, there is the colonial gaze, but there is also the problem of the power relations that have calcified over time in favor of men and in favor of traditional leaders. So the marginalization of women and the marginalization of the people in the name of the chiefs, which means it's again not serving the second theoretical underpinning. It still treats black people, African people as subjects, right? So it's not serving the equalizing um, role. Now, these are the two problems that cut across the various sections that you find in the bill. Whether one talks about section 28, which deals with what is called land administration and the choice on land administration. Um, you know what will happen uh, for those who are interested in this? When this bill comes into operation, this is my third problem with it, which is the actual administration on a day-to-day -day basis. When it comes into operation, you will have a scenario in which a community, and again, there is an ambiguous definition of a community that ultimately suggests that a community is a place that uh, has a chief as its leader, right? So when you say community, it's not, it doesn't mean really people, it simply means uh, it's got that traditional community element to it. And if you read it together with the other pieces, the community, is the place that is run by the chief. So once the bill comes into operation, there will be various choices, right? In which so-called community may make a choice about 
how to administer the land. Number one, under the traditional council. Number two, under a communal property association. And number three, under any other entity as may be approved by the minister. So that's gonna be the administration structure. So think about it. Community already includes a traditional council, but the section also adds a traditional council as another vehicle for the administration of the land. And then think about a communal property association, which in 2013, the department said, communal property associations do not work, they should be scrapped. And then think about any other entity that may be approved by the minister. So we are back again to traditional authorities. So there is an ongoing entrenchment of the role of traditional authorities to the sacrifice of true community decisions. This is odd. Why? Because the ANC claimed that it wanted to implement the Freedom Charter. That's why it got into power. And the Freedom Charter says the land shall be shared among those who work it. It never intended that the land would now be controlled at a state level or at a traditional uh, 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 authority level. It always intended that it would be owned at communal. It was always a bottom-up um, approach. So we have a bill that is neither equalizing nor transformational as required by section 25.6 of the constitution. What are we going to do about the scenario? Option one, Aninka has spoken about, which is we have the judgment that has just been delivered by the KwaZulu Natal High Court that is beginning to talk meaningfully about customary law. And crucially in that judgment, it's not referring to an idealized form of customary law that is pre-conquest. It is talking about living customary law. In other words, what are the experiences of the people now? And that's the customary law that the constitution has in mind, right? It does not talk about a fossilized, calcified version of pre-1652 is talking about today's version of customary law. So our duty now is providing a fuller theorization of what is customary law in relation to land going to look like post the Kasak Ingonyama transport judgment. So it's giving effect to the notion of living customary law. What does living customary law look like? It's non-discriminatory. It is participative. It is uh, not gendered. It is future looking. It incorporates the youth. It dismantles patterns and structures of patriarchy. In other words, it's truly modern, right? The second thing quite apart from a fuller theorization of customary law is we have to be explicit in rejecting the bill. The bill needs to be scrapped, right? And rewritten. When it is scrapped and rewritten, communities don't want a bill drafted for them by the government. They want a bill in which their views are reflected. So step number two is a clear political demand for the scrapping of the bill and a new bill that is not going to be drafted from the top down, but it will be drafted from bottom up, right? Many, many communities know what they want. And the law's duty is to reflect what the people say, not what the politicians uh, say. They went there on account of the fact that they were representing our interests, not their interests. Step number three is building robust institutions of customary law 
building robust institutions that support community uh, structures. Many people have criticized communal property associations. They have weaknesses, but they still remain the most viable instrument for the carrying out of community interests. A demand ought to be made about availing resources and strengthening the existence of communal property associations and appending power relations so that those decisions are made explicitly by communities. Number four, it is not as if we are operating in the dark. We do have an alternative piece of legislation. It's called EPILRA. But EPILRA was done on an interim basis. But it sets out very basic protections. And unlike the Communal Land Rights Bill, its starting point is the individual, right? Its point of departure is the individual and not a nebulous notion of a community. So it's building. We are not going to be left in a vacuum if we scrap the Communal Land Rights Bill. So it's step number four is building a pillar up. Making it permanent is an option. Making amendments to it is an option. But the key to this is it is not for us, the elites, to decide, to create the structures that truly empower people to make their voices heard. Step number five, and this is the last, is winning our case at the Supreme Court of Appeal. Thank you, Nolun.